sometimes it's difficult to, in easy words, in simple, sim simple words, explain what is the market about. You know, as a CEO, probably two years ago, I will answer in a dinner something like that. I help companies you know, to automate processes. We help to improve operational efficiency. Boring. <laughs> Nobody gets a clue about what is operational efficiency. <laughs> Boring. But don't smile, because if you are in the academics, your answer is going to be probably worse. When I was working at INRIA, at that time, I was saying, you know, when I, I'm a researcher, I'm developing a project about coordination of collaborative activity in a BPM system. How do you want to put that in a, you know, in a dinner? So the thing that I want to illustrate here is that the majority of the projects that we're using as example are usually related to internal operations in companies. At least, you know, I'm talking here about a vendor, a vendor perspective. So it's a, it's a lot about cost reduction, being more efficient, making people more efficient, reducing costs, improving margin. And don't get me wrong, you know, as a vendor, I love those projects, um, but uh, BPM is more than that. If you focus only on reducing and getting better, you are missing a key thing, which is probably the strategy. You know, there are some limitations if you only focus on improving things. What about innovation? What about trying to do things different than other people? This is when I think we have a challenge, and this is when we think we need to invest more and more and have more and more projects related to innovation and strategy, delivering better results to end users. So that's going to be you know, part of my presentation. So if we look some kind of basic, you know, the industry guys always like to look to Google Trends and those kind of things. No? So really simple Google Trend. If you compare BPM searches over time, the last six years here in, this, in the screen, to other, let's say, uh, sexy technologies like digital transformation, of course, digital transformation, everybody's talking about it. Um, uh, but if you compare that to, for example, user experience or customer satisfaction, you know, if we say that, let's try to see what is the BPM, what is the role of BPM in a, uh, providing a better user experience or improving customer satisfaction, right? So if you look to the popularity of those searches, you see, of course, the yield transformation growing up, you see BPM flat, and you see like a steady and 10 times more important user experience, customer satisfaction. That's number one priority those days for companies. I'm talking also about organizations, public organizations. So there's maybe an opportunity there for us. And I'm seeing more and more companies that we could define are operating using a customer-obsessed operating model. They're thinking customer first. So it's maybe time for us BPM specialists or part of the BPM ecosystem to start thinking also about customer first or end user first. And when I think that there is a good opportunity is that uh, even if you compare the popularity of BPM compared to other trends that we're seeing in the market, you know, a lot of people are talking now about low-code platforms, application platforms, and it looks like low-code is now the, 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 the thing that is going to solve all the problems. It's still less popular than BPM. So honestly, I think there is a big chance if we do it right, the whole ecosystem, not only, I'm not talking only about the industry, to become, to extend the BPM use cases and to become the reference platform to address digital transformation issues, to address initiatives that are impacting uh, customer, um, customer experience, and to uh, deliver more innovation. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. But first of all, that's kind of a funny thing. So do we, if we talk about digital transformation and the role of BPM in digital transformation, and you will see the link afterwards with artificial intelligence, do we all share a same understanding of what digital transformation is? Uh, we work with an uh, analyst group in the UK, uh, and they conduct a survey with top executives, both private and public sector, and they ask, what is digital transformation for you? And of course, they all kind of, at some point, say like, OK, we're going to change the way we operate. OK, that's good enough. But every single uh, executive was describing digital transformation to their own domain. So if you were asking to a human resources person, for, that, for him, digital transformation was about improving the way internally people share knowledge, we detect opportunities, we prevent risk, and we communicate better with employees. If you discuss with marketing, it was more external how prospects and customers are behaving, how we can better interact with them, how we can better read them. If you move to operations, people on sales, or people working on product, 
They were more interested on how we interact with other systems. And here, we started to talk about processes. And the reality is that digital transformation is all of that. It's like how we do massive, big change on the positive side of the, of the term that is going to impact positively the whole um, company or the whole organization to better serve the customers. So this is how I see the opportunity ahead related to BPM. And that's the four topics I'm going to be discussing in this presentation. First of all, how we can expose the process that usually were part of backend and operations to the end users. Second thing, how we can improve user experience. If you want to better engage with the users, we need to uh, also focus on user experiences. Uh, how we can work with use cases that requires different organizations working uh, with the same set of processes. Usually, the majority of the projects that I'm, I'm seeing as a, as a vendor are one company using BPM uh, you know, internally or to serve the customers, but there is only one company involved. What happens if you have different companies involved? And last topic, which I wanna, that's going to be the meat of the presentation, is what is the role there of artificial intelligence? It was the title of the presentation. You will see that I'm doing that in that order because each one is enriching the previous one. OK, making back office processes accessible to users. This is not about technology. For me, this is about the mindset. Uh, do we want to approach a new BPM project as, again, something that reduces costs, something that improves operations? Uh, or do you want to see it as, OK, let's automate things because they need to be automated. They can be more efficient, but let's put the end user first. So it's more the approach. And when you look at that, it's maybe because we need to call what you are doing an application, no? Let's build an application that allows people to do something. And at this application is going to be based on process. Um, a good example of that is a pharmaceutical company. Those are the guys that I. Uh, I, I, really like, I really like working with uh, Bristol Myers. Uh, those guys are based in New Jersey. And as any pharmaceutical company, uh, those guys have a ton of process to automate and a ton of process that can be more efficient. And all of them, or a big majority of them, are related to drug discovery, drug testing. That's a typical uh, example. Rather than just trying to automate and be more efficient, they say, like, how we can also make sure that the guys that are using those kind of processor applications, so the scientists can spend more time on science. Let's think about those guys first, rather than just automate things, uh, automate the processes. Um, um, and so they decided to do process automation inside the day-to-day -to -day tools that those guys were using. So they were, they were not in belt, inventing new UIs. They were not inventing new ways to interact with the process. They just say they are really using different tools to do their work. Let's try to add flexibility by adding there the BPM piece that was missing. So a really easy way to expose something that sometimes can be really operational to people that are doing or operating on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, after that, they start adding, realizing that they can add new applications on top of those processes and adding more value when the guys saw the benefit of using BPM. It's one example. Some people in the industry will call that model-driven platform or low-code. You know, in the industry, we always like to talk about the trends. So a lot of people say, like, this is BPM is now a low-code platform. And I think it is, because when you, when you see a, what a low-code platform definition is, that looks really familiar to me, no? Like, let's help people share knowledge, better coordinate work internally, cross boundary, cross departments. Let's make sure that we can make it easy to change the behavior, and let's monitor what's going on. Uh, so actually, between me and you, I don't know how you can be a low-code platform if you don't have some kind of process on it, but I will keep it for another, another session. Um, and then, of course, there is what is the amount of code that you need uh, to do in a low-code platform. That's another session as well. But uh, I think that we can honestly say that uh, if we think application, if we think uh, user first, uh, uh, there is a big chance that a BPM platform can become a, a really good low-code platform. Good opportunity. Second thing, this is more about technology, but what can we do to improve the user interaction? And I will start even blaming us, the vendors, here. We can all do a better job. We spend hours and hours automating, finding patterns, you know, doing monitoring, a ton of things, and at the end, a guy needs to do something, and you have a crappy interface. What about this one? We all have this one. 
And I, I took this one because it's a screen copy of Bonita as well. So we also, as everyone in this industry, we have also a task list, a to-do list, a work list. When I started in this domain 16 years ago, the first thing that we implemented with Francois from Iria was a task list as well. Okay, that's good, and it's useful in some scenarios. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's nice to have an overview of all the processes and activities that you have in your platform, but this is not user-friendly at all. So let's get rid of that, and let's build custom UIs. Let's make sure that uh, we think about the user, the, the process, and then we think about how people are going to interact. And people like that you speak their language. People like graphics. People like mobile. People don't like a task list, word list, or to-do list. So let's get rid, please, of to-do list, if possible. Uh, so in that case, if, you, if we get rid of to-do list, what, what we can do? So uh, we're not reinventing here the wheel, but uh, OK, let's make sure that uh, even if you propose kind of a task list, let's at, le at least uh, make it configurable and extensible. Second thing, uh, let's provide tooling so you can build your own custom uh, interface. Let's still provide the flexibility to build everything from scratch if you are uh, you know, a developer and you want to code everything. And, and, and more important, let's provide a mix of all the three approaches. What I'm seeing more and more is people that they say, OK, Miguel, we have a, a team of developers with different skills. Of course, if there is something that is out of the box, we would like to use it. But if you pr propose us with some tooling to drag and drop a UI, we're going to do it. And some other people are going to code new pages and HTML5 and bring it into the mix. Can we mix those three approaches? And maybe at some point you have the task list as a page on the administration view. That's fine. But let's, let's provide this flexibility. This is about user interfaces. And that sounds obvious, but user interface is not user experience. I was talking before about let's focus on the customer. Let's focus on the end user. Let's focus on providing uh, good user experiences. The user interface is part of a user experience, but it's not a user experience. So I think that the definition of Wikipedia should be something like that, a take, the takeaway feeling of a user after interacting with an application. So can you imagine the, the takeaway feeling of a user after interacting with a task list? And this is a kind of a binary feeling. If it's either good or bad, it was a crappy experience or it was a fantastic experience, but it's not in the middle. So if, you, if we don't get like a, the binary one there, the whole project is not going to be successful. Uh, what is the, so why I think that this is a big chance for us as being in the BPM um, space uh, if we invest in user experience in the next coming years is because when you build an application based on processes, you have all the elements to provide a, a, a really nice user experience. BPM technology now is about uh, the process, but of course interacting with other systems to get the business data. And it's also more and more about providing the tools to build the nice UIs. If you connect those three elements in a seamless way, the user experience is going to be fantastic. And it's going to be probably w uh, way more maintainable than if you code things. So we have a huge opportunity here. Let's start focused also on the how we personalize your interface, how we uh, create better user experience. That's a big chance for, for, for the market. A uh, good example of uh, uh, illustrating that. So let's change a little bit of the use cases that are about pure process automation. I don't know if you know this company, Enernock, is a, is a company based on, in Boston. And those guys, they do a software that they call energy intelligence. Uh, I love those guys. Those guys, are, uh, basically, what they do is like they have as, a co as, as clients, they have the utilities in different countries, for example, the US. And those utilities, at some point, you know, when you are in August in Arizona, it's going to get really, really hot. So they want uh, to reduce uh, the consumption of electricity. So Enerog, what they do is like they go to see small providers, small users. So basically, that could be a pizzeria, or that could be a small shop, or that could be a medium-sized uh, company. And those guys are get paid for reducing the consumption of electricity. And then the big guys, the utilities, are making some savings. So that's a good example of innovation, uh, user experience, and uh, uh, using BPM for that. Because those guys invented a model that didn't exist before, pure innovation. Of course, there is a ton of process behind that. There is a lot of automation. But you know, there are three different companies involved. You have the providers, the pizzeria. Then you have the Enernock employees. Uh, the majority are data science guys. Then you have 
the utilities, could be Endesa here in Spain. I think, by the way, Endesa bought the neural network recently. Um, uh, so, uh, so you know, those, those kind of things are, are the examples that we want to see more and more uh, in the space. And of course, in terms of the user experience, uh, I saw the guys operating that at Enernoc. There is at some point something that cannot be automated in which you need human intelligence. So they have the right experience as well to interact and make the right decisions. Really good example of what I wanted to illustrate. OK, so we saw really briefly one side how we, I think we should change the mindset when we approach a project. Second thing, why user experience is important. Let's go into a little bit more advanced topics. So uh, how we can also apply BPM technology to uh, situation in which multiple organizations are working together. Um, I'm not a blockchain expert, but that sounds really familiar no? to blockchain. So, um, uh, and of course, blockchain is really well known for uh, uh, managing money transactions, especially Bitcoin. Uh, but the essence of any blockchain implementation is the same, so it should be something like that. Uh, yeah, sorry if you are an expert also in blockchain, but just to describe really quickly, how blockchain works is exactly about uh, how people can exchange assets. In that case, and in blockchain is in, in bit Bitcoin, sorry, is usually money. So uh, the good thing about blockchain is that uh, decentralized technology. So uh, there are many of benefits. We'll see that. But the way it works is if you want to exchange money between A and B, you basically you build a transaction. You broadcast this transaction. Well, this transaction is represented as a block. This block is broadcasted to different nodes of the blockchain. All the nodes need to validate the transaction. Only after that, the transaction is chained to the block. The block is chained. And only after all those operations, the money goes from A to B. What is the benefit of using blockchain in those kind of deployments? So of course, decentralized. So in terms of you don't have a single point of failure. Of course, uh, the trustability. Uh, of course, immutability. When a transaction is done, it's done. It's like a traditional BPM before the case management stuff. It's like when it's done, it's done. You cannot go back, and uh, it's done. And it's recorded, and, and it's trustable. What are, the, what are the issues? Sorry for the challenges. So it's uh, what happened in terms of regulation, if anyone, anyone can join the blockchain. What about energy consumption? If you, every time that you do a transaction, you need to replicate this, this transaction among a 1,000 nodes. In terms of energy consumption and energy green is probably not uh, the best. What about privacy, etc.? Uh, there are recent implementation of blockchains that are more about private blockchains, trying to solve some of those issues. Can we say that a blockchain implementation is private rather than public? Can we re restrict the number of uh, nodes to the number of participants, organizations, or companies that are involved? That's also bringing some benefits. Transaction time is is improved. It's not the same to, to replicate a transaction among four nodes than about 1,000. Of course, uh, the data uh, is going to be more secure because it's, it's not exposed to everyone. And of course, it's easy to do auditability. If I'm saying all that, it's because this is what I think BPM and blockchain makes a ton of sense. Because what is, even if you are using a blockchain implementation, what are going to be the issues of doing a blockchain application? You need to code a ton of business logic to build the transactions, to work with the data, to interact with the different uh, cores. You need to also build a usually different UIs or different applications for each one of the participants, because probably the, the company A is not going to see the same thing that the company B. So you have exactly the same issues with a traditional BPM application, but you know, exposed to the number of people potentially that are going to join. I don't know if you ever try to illustrate that with a, an example. I don't know if you ever move internationally uh, and you try to ship your, um, you know, uh, your boxes uh, uh, using uh, either air or ship transportation. I did that last year. I moved uh, with my family from San Francisco to Paris. And that was the worst user experience ever, you can imagine. You know, how that works. And I was in the Silicon Valley. You know that, of course, there was a platform in which you can say, I'm moving. And this is the weight that I want to move. Uh, and this is the date I'm going to start, whatever. And there, went, there were some people like trying to bid for getting my project. But at the end of the day, you end up dealing with uh, one company that comes to your place, takes the boxes, 
and bring it to the port of San Francisco. A second company that tried to squeeze your boxes into a container and send it to uh, Le Havre in France. And third company that is helping you to manage customs. Then you pay the guys from the customs. Uh, then if everything is OK, then you have another company that is going to take your boxes and bring it to Paris. And maybe another company that is going to bring the boxes up to your um, uh, flat in, in, in Paris. So why? Because those guys are not working on the same process, because there is no full trustability, because they have not connected. So those are the kind of applications that we're going to see more and more happening with blockchain. And again, uh, you can put a, a process or multiple processes on it. You can have processes interacting with uh, the blockchain network. You can build a UIs on top of those processes uh, related to that. So this is a way that they see for BPM to accelerate the adoption of blockchain, more complex application. So uh, to illustrate that in another example, car order management. You want to buy a car, and you have different people involved. The car uh, um, retailer, you can maybe have the production side, and maybe why not the government you know, validating something. So just to illustrate the complexity, I'm going to be just focusing on one simple step. How do you implement a transaction using blockchain? For example, a guy has the money. He has agreed on the car that he want to buy. And he just want to buy a car. So the transaction is going to be the, cars, the car retailer selling a car to a user. In blockchain, without BPM, it's going to be something like that. You have a private blockchain implementation with two cores, one representing the car retailer, and the other one representing the user. And the transaction that we want to do is one single transaction. I want to buy a car. John Doe want to buy a car for 10K. So what's happening is uh, in blockchain, so you need to code it, it's going to be an account, so the car store, that is going to spend one white car in exchange of money. For that, you need to build a, what they call a partial transaction in, in blockchain. This partial transaction is going to be used by the second core of blockchain. And basically, uh, John Doe is going to pay 10K, and he in exchange is going to get uh, uh, the white car. So all that needs to be hard code on top of the blockchain implementation. And honestly, only that is not that simple. How you can do that with BPM? And again, it's just one single portion of a whole application there. So you can have a single process with two steps. One step, prepare the payment. Another one, confirm the payment. You can have connectors to interact in a generic way with the blockchain implementation. All the blockchain implementation has now REST APIs, public APIs, or Java APIs, and even SDK to interact with them. Uh, you can store all the personal data into your favorite database that is going to be reused. And even you can build different user interfaces to allow different people to see different things on the, on the blockchain. So uh, and again, this is just one single step of a blockchain application. So uh, I think we're going to start seeing more and more uh, integration between blockchain and BPM, because that makes sense, especially if BPM is evolving into providing better user experiences. OK, so we finally get to artificial intelligence. So how we bring artificial intelligence to the mix? Um, so, uh, so you are the experts here in artificial intelligence and BPM. Uh, you know, but you, just a kind of a, a reminder of uh, what are the use cases that I see uh, those days uh, in which I, AI sorry, uh, is in contact with BPM? The majority of the use cases that I see are related to the process execution. I'm not saying that this is bad. This is just a fact. It's like the majority of the use cases that you can see, at least from a vendor's perspective, is, uh, OK, let's trigger a new process based on a machine learning intuition. Typical example, I'm. Uh, look into some data into social network, and uh, I'm detecting that some people are unhappy, and let's create, an es let's create a new instance of an escalation process. Why not? Because I'm predicting that something uh, is going to be really bad there. Second thing, uh, routing process in motion. Typical example, for example, uh, insurance company. Depending on the prediction on a risk of a new insurer, you want to go left or right in a process. Second simple example. Third example that we are seeing every day is next best action. Again, back to the customer support example, three steps in parallel based on historical data. What is my prediction and suggestion in which, which is the one that you should do first? Why not? OK, so that's more about AI 
as part of the process execution. Second thing that uh, we are not seeing that much, but I think we're going to start seeing more and more, is intelligent uh, robotic process automation. Again, another topic in which uh, everybody now in the industry is talking about robotic process automation. I put intelligent there because, by definition, robotic process automation is not intelligent at all. I'm not saying that it's not useful. It's just not intelligent. Um, so robotic process automation, just because it's a bird's word, is just in situations in which uh, you don't have interfaces, REST APIs, for example, available to interact with some systems, um, you need to have a, a human that is basically replicating and interacting with a, with a UI, replicating information. For example, again, customer support, I'm changing for whatever reason uh, I'm moving, so I, I want to update uh, my address. There are some people that are doing that in three different systems. Because again, they are not automating that with a process because they cannot reach those systems using APIs. So they need to go through different legacy UIs and do it manually. So that robotic product automation is a script. What is intelligent robotic automation? That's a little bit more sexy. It's like, can we, during the process execution, detect some patterns and predict that uh, we think that some of the steps in your process are candidates for robotic, robotic process automation? And then from there, they're, OK, use our RPA product to this step three, four, and five, automate it as part of an RPA script. That's a little bit more tricky to do. And I'm seeing some people start working on that respect from a, from a uh, technology perspective. Uh, oh. And this is the one that I would like to spend a little bit more time, because this is what we, that we are actually currently working on. I think that artificial intelligence, the two previous cases are really valid use cases. But we are actually more interested on how we can use artificial intelligence to do continuous improvement of our processes and process-based applications. Why? I was saying before that more and more people are using a BPM platform to build applications based on processes that provide a better user experience. So uh, if you are not able to demonstrate that you can easily improve over time those processes and those applications, then people are going to start ask, ask, asking you awkward questions like, uh, well, should I hard code the process logic or the application logic? And we want to avoid that. Of course, uh, one of the benefits of using a, a, a BPM uh, tool is maintainability and evolutivity. So, but this evolutivity and this maintainability is usually done based on human intelligence. Can we help humans to detect that there are some inefficiencies or potential improvements uh, on any single process-based application. That's the thing that we are interested in. And you will see that we are interested on the process side of the story and in the user inter interface side of the story. So how it works? Really simple. Well, really simple to say. Uh, let's make predictions on process execution based on a goal. Um, again, you cannot make predictions if you don't have a goal in mind. So uh, the typical example is usually, let's make predictions on remaining time that usually can apply a ton of different use cases. Let's recommend improvement actions. There are situations in which just predict is enough. I'm not a big fan of that for BPM. If you are not able to recommend, just making a prediction is not going to solve the continuous improvement problem. So I'm really interested on making predictions that can bring recommendations. And the recommendations needs to bring two actions. And I like to see actions classifying to different um, um, categories. One will be what I call short loop actions. So there is an inefficiency. So you are predicting something. What are the options that you have to act? The typical example is let's route the task to another user. But can be let's change a form design, a widget on a form. Let's uh, replace a connector to another system that we are predicting that is going to fail on Friday's afternoon. Um, let's. Uh, also bring here the concept of next best action. Those are things that you can apply immediately. There are other things that are more like, I call it long loop. It's like, OK, it's not a single action that is going to solve it. So even if you are able to predict and recommend, it's like, man, I think it's something wrong with your design. So <laughs> you need to review your design. So it's going to take a little bit uh, more time. Uh, but at least we would like to be able to not only recommend, but to act, and of course, to measure. This is way where, sorry, I kind of think this is probably the resolution of the screen. Um, the, so then you have, if you start thinking about artificial intelligence, as a BPM provider, you have two options. Either you become a data science platform, 
right side of the story. And I don't think this is our job, because there are fantastic data science platforms um, out there. So 